probably also takes what I say, hyper aware um, leadership. They're paying attention to that, to be constantly on the lookout for who's the talent in our organization that has the potential to rise. Yes, absolutely. I think that you, you have to be very open minded to see where that's going to come from. And you have to be looking around all the time and say, who's excelling, who, who deserves to be elevated. And I think that's that uh, from, from a manager or a leader, that's just a constant, a constant thing that they have to be doing and they have to be adept at. Welcome to the Pivotal Leader Podcast with Gina Tremarco, featuring lively interviews with CEOs, entrepreneurs, and thought leaders who share their stories and best practices for shifting business from problems to profits. Sit back and get ready to pivot. Hey, everybody, it's Gina Tremarco, Chief Results Officer of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift their cultures from people problems to performance results. Each week on The Pivotal Leader, I feature inspirational leaders who know how to positively impact their customers, employees, and brands. On this episode of The Pivotal Leader, I interviewed Tom Murray, former CEO of Calvin Klein, where he ran the company for 17 years and facilitated the brand's growth from $2.8 billion to $8 billion. Prior to that, he spent the majority of his career working for iconic fashion brands, one including Tahari, which is one of my favorites, and rising through the ranks to the greatest job in the world, working alongside designer extraordinaire Calvin Klein. With the same no-nonsense approach that he applies to fashion, Tom now shares his knowledge about business, leadership, and creating a career that one can be both proud of and one that is of service to others. Murray teaches up-and-coming managers and leaders how he did it and how they too can excel not only in the fashion industry, but in any business. So let's listen in and learn from Tom Murray. I'm uh, excited to have you on the show. Your um, background information was really interesting. And what really caught my attention was you went from oil rig to CEO of Calvin Klein. So that was really intriguing. That was the first thing that hit me. I'm like, I need to know, how did you go from working oil rigs to working in fashion? Yeah, everybody likes that story. Uh, it, it's really kind of interesting, but it was only a three three month job during the summer from college. And prior to that, I had always been involved in one way or the other of fashion apparel, working in men's stores and so on. And as soon as I got out, out from the oil rig, I went back to college and then I got back into that again. So really, um, my whole life I've been involved one way or the other in apparel, fashion, etc. And you said in some of your information that you felt the power of teamwork and learned that the same rules apply from the rig to the runway to the boardroom, which I found really interesting. Could, could you elaborate a little more on that? Well, yeah, sure. It was, uh, it was an interesting experience. My father was an oil executive and he knew the company, he knew the CEO of the company that owned the oil rig. So she, he got me this summer job out there. I was 80 miles out from Cameron, Louisiana, which is Cajun country. Wow. So I arrived in, on a work boat, three hour, three hour ride, seasick when I got there, as everyone else was, brand new helmet, long hair, <laughs> etc. I just stuck out like a sore thumb. And not to mention the fact that I had taken one of those Cajuns jobs to get that job for the summer. Oh. Day one, I was not liked. And so I got on, got on the rig, or I got on what's called the tender, which is an old Navy ship attached to the rig mm-hmm. where the roustabouts live and work, and that's what I was, was a roustabout. So the first night in the shower, they were shoving me back and forth, five or six of them, and, you know, calling me, I think, uh, Guinevere or Antoinette, or I've forgotten now what it was, some Antoinette, yeah, my wife's here. <laughs> and, uh, I, knew it was a, I knew it was a French name, but it, it was because of my hair and the whole thing. So I was a wrestler in college and high school. I was a pretty tough kid. So they, but they started pushing me back and forth. And I thought, you know, this, is, this is, could be a life-endangering situation because people, particularly back then, died on these rigs all the time. It was not an infrequent occurrence. So I started fighting back. I had no choice. And the fact that I did start fighting back gained me a lot of respect from those guys. Mm. Long story short, we became, I became friends and partners with them. And on a, in such a dangerous situation like that, you really have to work as a team. You have to walk out for each other because what's called the casing swings from the, from the uh, it's, it's got, it has two guidelines, cables attached to each end of the casing and what a rouse bout does largely. 
is you know guide that from the from the uh, work boat up to the up to the tender, and both boats are are rocking usually at different angles and different times, and so it begins to swing, and you have to duck out of the way and watch out for one another. And so that, that really uh, it became a really important team experience. You know, building those relationships was a really important part of it. Working hard, gain respect from them for, you know, a co- you know, well-to-do college kid doing uh, really hard work, 12 hours a day minimum. Uh, and so that, that, whole, that whole thing just was an amazing experience for me. It taught me a lot about teamwork, team culture. It was only three months, but I gained a lot out of it, and I, I just wouldn't trade it for anything. The first thing that came to my mind was you're literally in a situation where you're rocking the boat, multiple boats. Yes, yes, absolutely. That's a good analogy. <laughs> and you, you think about that in um, a corporate environment or a fashion environment especially, how did rocking the boat show up in the fashion industry? Every job that I had, to some degree, there was some rocking of the boat. You know, every time a new manager comes in, <clears throat> they want to make some modifications, obviously, and that's why they were brought in. So I, I can't really think of a specific example, but I, you know, I was in the industry for 40 years. I had many jobs, gaining respect from your employees and coworkers and all of that, all of those kinds of important issues. And I think I got uh, pretty good at it over the years. So how did you transition from that, that summer job into the fashion industry? Could you give us a little bit of a picture of what that journey looked like? Sure, sure. When I got back to college, I went to, uh, I went to, I went to Oklahoma State University and I was working after school in uh, a men's store. And so and that just sort of continued. And then when I graduated, uh, I ended up working for head ski and sportswear which was in, in working with, originally I was the merchandise manager and all the designers reported to me and the head of design was 45 years old or so. And I was probably 21 and uh, it was, it was an amazing opportunity, but I just wasn't ready for it yet. And I just didn't have the experience yet. So I went to Alex Schuster, the president of the company. I said, you know, I'm amazed with this opportunity. I said, uh, and I, I appreciate the fact that you think I have the potential and I appreciate it, but it's just, um, it's just too soon. I, I'm not qualified for this. I'd like to have a job out in sales because you learn a lot in sales. You, mm-hmm. know, you, have to, you really do. It's an, I think to be a good salesman is a really good, important skill to have to be successful really in any career over the time. You have to be able to convince people and you have to be able to listen and you have to do all of those kinds of things that a good salesman does. So that, that was a great opportunity. And so I went back, he gave me a large territory in sales and eight states. And I made a lot of money. I had a lot of fun. And uh, so that was how, that's what, how that happened. And the next job that I ended up in was uh, at a company called College Town which was a very large women's moderate apparel maker based up in, in, in Braintree, Massachusetts. First, I started in sales again, and then, he, then the CEO of the company, a man named Arthur Sibley, brought me into the company uh, to be his predecessor, I mean, to follow him in the job. Hmm. And he, so what happened is he gave me one entire year to do nothing but go from department to department and learn about the apparel industry, all aspects of it, manufacturing, merchandising, finance, you name it. And it was like getting a PhD in the, in the uh, apparel industry. So, you know, I stayed there for a number of years and then, the, then it transferred me down to New York. I was responsible for sales and marketing and, you know, all of those were just incredible opportunities. And so from there, I went to a women's apparel company called Tahari, which is still a very successful women's company. Oh, I'm very familiar with Tahari. Ellie uh, (laughs) is still a good good friend of mine, and I was president there for seven years. Uh, And then the next thing was Calvin Klein. I was offered the job at Calvin Klein, which was a global job. That was really uh, an amazing experience for me with uh, Tahari. And we grew that business. I had a lot of fun. As I said, I had a great relationship with Ellie Tahari, and then Calvin Klein came along, the international, men's and women's. No way I could not take that. Right. And that, was, that really was my dream job. 
And so I was COO for a couple of years, and then I was promoted to CEO, and I was, I was um, CEO for 17 years there. And as you know, we were able to grow the business from $2.8 billion in, remote, in, in retail sales to almost $8 billion in retail sales during my tenure there. So that was uh, really the best experience of my life in, in, in terms of uh, a job, and it was the, the best job that I ever had. It was truly a dream job. I want to I want to talk a little bit about because I know some of the work that you're doing now, and you have a new book coming out. Your book's not out yet, correct? No, it's going to be out next year. Um, you have a book coming out called A Great Fit, which I think is a great title. Mm-hmm. And I want to talk to you a little bit about finding a great fit when it comes to talent, but but on the other end of that, for the rising CEO, for the for the person aspiring to get to that C-suite CEO position. That's a great story that you, someone saw something in you and gave you an opportunity to come in and shadow and take over for them. Um, how do you position yourself to get to that place to be identified and someone says, hey, come shadow me so you can take over a CEO? Well, I think it starts with uh, very, very hard work. You know, I used to get there very early. I used to leave very late. I was, I think, very productive. I got a lot of things done. I had great energy. And, you know, I had, uh, fortunately, I had good taste. I think that's an innate thing. And so that always relates to your ability to interact with uh, merchandisers. I mean, I was a merchandiser for most of my career, which merchandising interacts with design, as you Mm -hmm. know. I had to have the talent to be able to gain their respect and work with them and develop teams and all of those kinds of things. So I worked hard at that, as I said a moment ago, and I was noticed. I was noticed for my hard work and my ability to work with designers and creative people and also um, my background in, in everything from production. I did QC work when I was at College Town. I just had, as I said, the PhD in the apparel industry. So all those skills came into play. For me, and someone basically noticed it. Yes, in each in each job I had, I was fortunate enough to have someone notice my potential, and 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 that was a, you know, a lot of what I attribute my success to. So it's really important to how you show up and how you roll up your sleeves to be noticed. Do you have any other advice around? You know, what if you're not noticed? Because as times change and technology and people are really distracted by the noise around them, do you have any suggestions on how someone can raise their hand and, and say, hey, notice me. I want, yeah. I, want, I, want to get, I want to do the CEO track. I think, um, you know, in addition to hard work and high visibility, the thing that worked for me was my ability to interact with all, all my peers. And that's where the team player, I've, I've always been a team player my entire career. And, you know, that, that was, that's a way to become noticed because you don't want an employee, in my view, that is difficult to get along with, has problem, interaction problems with their coworkers and their, you know, their management and all that kind of stuff. So I think that is a good way to become noticed and, you know, have management to say, you know, this is a person that has talent, they work hard. Not only that, they interact well in the organization. So I think this is a person that has great potential for us. And it probably also takes what we call, what what I say, hyper aware um, leadership that they're paying attention to that, to be constantly on the lookout for who are, who, who are, who's the talent in our organization that has the potential to rise. Yes, absolutely. I think that you, you have to be very open-minded to see where that's going to come from. And you have to be looking around all the time and say, who's excelling? Who, who deserves to be elevated? And I think that's, that uh, from, from a manager or a leader, that's just a constant, a constant thing that they have to be doing and they have to be adept at. So let's switch up a little bit. You talk a little bit about the fundamental to business success, and there are four principles to execution. Can, can you touch on those four, four yeah. principles? Sure. In the, in the imperial industry, and, 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 you know, the four things that were always important, and there are many other things, but the four principles that were always important <clears throat> is ship a quality product. The worst thing you can do to, is to hurt a brand image is ship a product that is not high quality. And you have to ship it on time because that's the way that retailers become, you know, whether it's internal retail or external retail, that's one of the ways you become profitable and you have to be profitable to be successful. And so it has to be, uh, also it has to be great design. 
a really great design that's distinctive and consistent with the brand image and all those kinds of things. That's also very important to brand building. And the last one is that it has to be merchandised <clears throat> well for, and has to be targeted to your uh, consumer, the, the appropriate consumer. And that's, that's critical. All, all four points are very critical to being successful. And the last point is where merchandising, for the most part, comes in. Merchandisers watch at retail performance, what's working, what isn't, and they're able to do more. And they're able to communicate more of what worked and less of what didn't work. They're able to, they have to communicate that to the design team. They have to have great respond, great uh, relationship and rapports with the design team to be able to in, in, in get them to do what is need, needs to get done. And so those really are the four principles that work for me. And it was always the same. And I think it's largely the same in any industry. But what I've pointed out to you is what worked for me in the apparel industry. Yeah, and I wanted to ask you, how do you take that same that same philosophy, those same principles, and let's say apply them in a service type of industry? Could, could you touch on that a little bit? Well, you know, I'm, yes, and I'll try. I mean, I've never been involved in a service industry, uh, you know, exclusively. I was always involved in product-driven businesses, right. you know, wholesale or retail. But I do think the fundamentals apply. If it's service, you have to be on time. It has, it has to be something that works for <laughs> consumer, you know, and you have to be able to communicate that to the people that are developing the service. And, and so I think really there are parallels yeah. for each, each of the four principles. Absolutely. That's, I mean, those are things that came to mind for me. I know we have a lot of listeners who are in service industries um, and having a quality service and making sure that it's designed right so that it attracts people to the service um, and that that you are doing what you say you're going to do at the time you're going to do it and deliver it, being consistent with it. So I think that there's a lot of parallels to that to anyone who's listening that has more of a service industry. Absolutely. So, I, I totally agree. Let's talk about team player culture. This is big for you. You obviously learned that team player philosophy early on in college. How can leaders create a more collaborative team player culture? Well, I think it starts, uh, first of all, you have to hire people that are team players. And, you know, I interviewed a lot of people over the years, so I became very good at that. So you look at their work history, and I was able to, in, during, during interviews, to determine if this person had you know, the potential to be a good, good team player. And then once they enter the organization, you know, I think a lot of it comes from leadership. And I was always, uh, you know, I've always been a team player my entire career, and I've always surrounded myself with team players, which is what I attribute, uh, which is probably the most important thing that I attribute my success to. And so I think, you know, by example and by leadership, you know, you can, you can create that environment. And, if, you know, if you find that you made a mistake and somebody is not fitting in, is not part of a team culture, you have to make a change. Because, you know, one bad apple can destroy the barrel. And so over the years, I had to make those kinds of difficult changes from time to time, but not very often, really. For the most part, I always was fortunate to have a good team, team culture, team players. And as I said, that's really, I think, a major reason for the success I was able to enjoy. Did you have strategies around how you attracted that talent? Because a lot of times it starts with the recruitment of having top talent in that mindset. Sure. The, uh, you know, the people that I interviewed always came through, always on the same page with human resources, with the kinds of people that I was looking for. And so whether it was me or one of my direct reports, we were fed the, the people with the right potential for the most part. And that was a big that was a big piece of it. Do you think you had some influence in that in directing HR to recruit based on your vision and company core values. Oh yeah, absolutely. I had a, a very good relationship with our head of human resources there, who was there the whole time I was there. He's still there. And you know, he was a great partner and is a great, was a great partner. I'm sure he's a great partner to the new management team. And so the people that came in for the most part were already really qualified because he, he and his organization knew what I and my organization were looking for. So that saved a lot of time, a lot of energy, and it was really a key component in making us successful from uh, you know, an employee standpoint. When I'm not doing this podcast and I'm not running a 
training and strategy company. I also own um, an improv comedy club. I read that. That's, I found that fascinating. <laughs> Thank you. And so I have a lot of experience in managing different personality types. And it's really interesting when you get a group of performers together because they're all from different walks of life and no, none of them are really the same other than there's a, a, a common core value of a passion for the arts and performance um, and the challenge of improv versus any other kind of art form. And so when you think of fashion or you see the movie, uh, The Devil Wears Prada, uh-huh. there's definitely stereotypes with what the fashion world is like. And I do have some friends in the fashion world who say, oh, there are moments that are just like that. What is some of your experience or perspective on maybe those um, higher maintenance personalities or what is stereotyped as a high maintenance personality or diva personality? Uh, did you experience that? I, I want the scoop on that. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe some well, recommend, recommendations on, you know, uh, the creative personality is, is definitely different than others. Yeah. Well, I was fortunate enough to not ever have to work in an environment like was portray- as was portrayed in The Devil Wears Prada. <clears throat> but I did have challenging designers over the years. You know, and, and that's the very nature of that of that. Uh, individual and you know, the world they come from, the world they live in, they can be challenging and they, they require a uh, unique style of management. They reti- mm-hmm. require their own space. They're creative individuals. They're very different than the, really the rest of the organization, whether it be the merchandisers or all, all the rest of it. And so I spent a lot of time on that. It takes a lot of patience. You have to get, you have to gain their respect and you know, I could I'd say this to anyone in any in any industry that does. They're all you have to be a great listener to be a great manager. And first of all, it, it helps to have the right talent in the first place. But once you once you have that talent, it requires. I think I spent more time and energy working with designers than any other group, any other part of the organization, just because of you know the attention that it requires to have, make them feel like that they're being listened to and they have their own space and they can do what they need to do, but at the same time, not to limit their creativity. And that can be a fairly difficult balance to obtain and maintain. And they're, as I said, they're unique. You know, they're a different, but without them, we wouldn't have an in, in, industry. Right. So you, know, so you have to do, and as I said, I spent a tremendous amount of time cultivating and developing, you know, and building partnerships with uh, my design team. Thank, thank you for that. I think that's great advice because I think oftentimes there's a requirement of emotional intelligence in managing people and realizing that there are so many different personality types, some easier than others to manage. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, in the apparel industry and probably all industries, uh, in fashion and in all industries, you know, you have all different kinds of people that you're dealing with, whether it be the manufacturing, production, arm, finance, design. It's just, uh, you know, you have to wear a lot of hats to be successful. And I was fortunate that I had, I had some job one way or the other in every one of those categories before I became CEO. Now, did you have any kind of support or um, education tools or what were things that you did to continue to become a good and effective leader that knew how to manage those different personalities and create a culture of collaboration? What, how did you get help for yourself? My help, really, to a large extent, was my, my college education. I had a major in marketing. I graduated with a minor uh, no, I had a major in psychology, pardon me, and a oh. minor in marketing, and which served me really well. I had a great professor at Oklahoma State University who, was, uh, who taught me a lot about marketing and consumer behavior and psychology and how all that kind of works together. So I really remembered that, and I got a, a lot out of it, and I really sort of used it uh, my entire career. And then when uh, Calvin Klein became purchased by Phyllis Van Heusen, you know, that's a great, Phillips and Hughes is a magnificent company. Manny Sharika has done an amazing job. He's a good friend and we still are. And it's just done incredibly well. But they had uh, a great schooling and you know, a lot of educational kinds of programs for new, com- new, p- co- new employees coming in and what it took to be successful. And so there were a lot of uh, 
there was a lot of that kind of attention given by the PBH HR department. Now I had my own HR manager, which reported jointly to me and to the head of HR for PBH. So I think that that was, um, you know, that was a very important and critical step to maintaining and continuing the growth of Calvin Klein. All right. I need to know, what was it like working with Calvin Klein? Oh, that was the best part of my whole career. <laughs> I mean, he was, um, he is and was a true genius, a visionary. And I worked with him side by side for eight years, which is, was just an unbelievable experience. He was, you know, he, he was kind and, you know, he was also difficult, but those, you know, that personality type can right. be difficult. But, but you know what? He, I never resented it because he was always difficult for a reason. He always demanded <laughs> performance and, and, you know, always demand, demanded execution. And, and he was just, he wouldn't, he wouldn't accept, he wouldn't compromise, you know. And that's just part of the reason for Calvin's success. In addition to his incredible innate talent and taste and vision, you know, he started with a coat line, and which was um, influenced by Saint Laurent. And you know, so that really, way back then, sta- started to establish the Calvin Klein aesthetic, the minimal look and all the rest of mm-hmm. that. It's evolved to include other kinds of things, of course, now it's an $8 billion, almost an $8 billion retail business. But that, you know, the Calvin influence, it always remains, always will. And he, he is the reason that this company has had the success that it has. And I, I would never have changed. I would never change the experience that I had with him. It was invaluable. I bet. I was, I was dying to know about that. I've, I, I love Calvin Klein. I've got have many Calvin Klein dresses. That's my, my preferred style of what they do. So thanks for sharing that. Well, I'm glad you like that. My wife's in, entire closet is still Calvin Klein. I'm sure <laughs> it is. As is mine. <laughs> <laughs> do you still get an employee discount? That's the real question here. You know what? In the Madison <laughs> Avenue store, I still do. I okay. Still do. It, isn't that a nice thing? <laughs> that is a nice thing. I, I may tap into you for that although, one day. <laughs> although, I don't need, although I don't need too much because I probably have 30 South Calvin Klein suits, black label, made in Italy, Italian suits. I don't wear suits very often anymore because... Yeah. Most I wear shorts. <laughs> yeah, you're uh, you're down in Palm Beach, Florida, which is um, awesome. So, what are you doing now? What are your What are your plans? I know you have the the new book coming out, but what's next? Well, the uh, the book was a, it was a big deal. It took a lot of time. I'm doing a lot of interviews, as like this one right now. I've probably done thirty of these, you know. And other than that, I'm just really enjoying uh, retirement. You know, I don't have an alarm clock ever set. And I would just get up. My wife and I go for walks on the beaches. We play golf. We and my wife and I have been married for 44 years. She's my best friend. We have an amazing relationship. We live across the street from the ocean. So we live here year round. So it's actually, you know, it's a little secret that I'm letting out here is that it's pretty pleasant. Even in the summertime, (laughs) you get that the ocean breeze coming in. So, you know, I'm staying, staying actually busy. I, you know, I read the New York Times every day, keep up with what's going on with that. I read Women's Wear Daily, so I stay attuned to that. And, uh, you know, the time, the time flies. It, it really goes pretty fast. Well, good for you. Good for you. If it's time for us to start wrapping up the show, if people want to connect with you, learn more about with learn more about you, or find out about your book, what are some of the best ways? I mean, we'll put these in the show notes. Sometimes sure, people sure, are driving. Yeah. Yeah, great. They can go to the website, which is tommurray.com, or they can email me at uh, tom at tommurray.com. It has been such a pleasure having you on the show today. My pleasure, Gene. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, hold on. We're going to wrap up. Thanks, everybody, for listening to The Pivotal Leader today with uh, Tom Murray and myself. Uh, We really appreciate you listening. And before we go, I just want to mention a new opportunity to work with us. Pivot 10 Results is getting ready to launch an online improv-based sales training program that will increase sales and improve leadership skills. It's our spontaneous selling system. Visit our website, pivot10results.com, or email us at getresults at pivot10results.com. And until next time, if you want to maximize, you need to improvise. Now it's time for that cool voiceover guy to take us out. You've been listening to The Pivotal Leader with Gina Tremarco, owner and founder of Pivot 10 Results and Carolina Improv Company. 
You can find show notes for this episode on our website at thepivotalleader.com. The Pivotal Leader is a production of Pivot 10 Results, a strategy and training company that helps businesses shift from people problems to performance results. If your company needs help pivoting to success, visit pivot10results.com or email Gina at gina at pivot10results.com. And until next time, if you're feeling stuck in your business, it's probably time to pivot.